This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace, mercy, peace, and blessings to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and welcome to worship. Welcome, if this is the first time you're finding your way to this service, invite you to check out our website and go to the worship tab. If you feel so led, there's a virtual visitor card. We'd love to have you fill it out and to welcome you more personally. We are thrilled to share that the session met on Wednesday to welcome new members into the life of the congregation in Julie Bryce, Ben Owens, and little John, their son. Thank you, Julie and Ben, for bearing witness to the fact that even in this time of social distancing, the Holy Spirit does work through these digital means of connection to enlarge our hearts, to draw us closer into relationship with one another. We are thrilled to welcome you into the life of the church and can't wait to all be formed together in faith, hope, and love as we follow the pathway of discipleship that God would have us lead. Thank you, Trinity Avenue, for joining me and praying for these new members and for welcoming them into the life of the church. We are so, so grateful for the opportunity to be family together. This coming Wednesday is the beginning of Lent. We will christen the season with a 7 p.m. Ash Wednesday service over the course of Zoom. During that day, you are invited to come to the church to pick up some ashes that you might administer them during the service of worship when the time comes. If you are unable to make it to the church, we invite you to dig up some dirt from your yard or from a potted plant, or maybe get a little tray of olive oil, anything that represents the marking of the cross that we will offer on our own foreheads to remember the testimony of Ash Wednesday that from dust we came and to dust we shall return. Mindful of the frailty of the human experience and the human condition, we are also mindful of the needs in our community. As you come by to pick up your ashes, we invite you to drop off a donation to the Durham Diaper Bank, which is in desperate need of our support. There's information in your weekly email about that, and we're also going to be sending a special notice that invites you to the service with more details. We also invite you to journey through Lent with us as we, so, as we study two devotional books. One is a book on Julian of Norwich that Tommy Grimm is going to be leading that study. I will be leading a study on Lent of Liberation, uh, chronicling uh, details about slavery in American history and its ongoing impact. There will also be links coming up to you as there are, were links in your weekly email last week for how to order that book, bring it to your doorstep so that you can study with us. This Black History Month, we are drawing from the voices of Black scholars and liturgists in a special way and to share a bit of the way that the hymnody of the Presbyterian tradition is shaped by the inspiration and brilliance of Black composers is Harry Jansen. Diversity in worship music has been integral to our musical traditions here at Trinity Avenue Presbyterian Church. And in conjunction with Black History Month, I'd like to highlight just how much sacred music in the Afro-American tradition has meant to us over the years. To begin, a number of our favorite spirituals come to mind, such as Every Time I Feel the Spirit, Steal Away to Jesus, Go Tell It on the Mountain, and Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? They are among over 30 hymns included in our Glory to God hymnal, and they are all unique in their gospel message. They are also unique in their musical styles and language. While spirituals are most familiar to us, there are also sacred hymns included, like Lord Make Us More Holy, In Christ There Is No East Nor West, and Lord I Want to Be a Christian. We've included a number of arrangements of them in our virtual services these past months, primarily of solos. Well-known black composers such as Harry T. Burley played a significant role in the development of the American art song. He was the first Afro-American composer acclaimed for his concert songs, as well as for his adaptations of many spirituals. William L. Dawson was another highly regarded black composer. His arrangements of traditional Afro-American spirituals are widely published and have been frequently included in performances by school, church, and community choirs. Perhaps the most significant hymn is Lift Every Voice and Sing, number 339 in our hymnal. Often referred to as the Black National Anthem, it was first set as a poem by James Johnson in honor of Abraham Lincoln's birthday in 1900. It was later set to music by his brother, James Rosamond Johnson, and quickly gained popularity. 
It was soon adopted by the NAACP and became a cherished hymn for the civil rights movement. It bespeaks not only of freedom, but it is also for all who seek liberation from oppression. This music, like all great music, transcends racial, social, and political boundaries. I look forward to sharing more of this wonderful music in the weeks ahead. My hope is that our worship will be deepened through them. Thank you, Harry, for sharing that word with us. Don't forget that as we worship, you are invited to lift up your voices out loud whenever words appear on the screen to join us in singing, affirming your faith, or offering prayers. We've lost many and much to this pandemic. Don't let this pandemic take your singing. It doesn't matter how your voice sounds. Speaking the faith and singing the faith and being united in community as we are is good for the soul. So let your voice be heard in praise to the Lord. As we transition from arriving here to being here, let us be summoned by the words of scripture as we join our hearts with the voices of choirs of angels and saints who sing to the glory of God's name, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us prepare our hearts for the worship of Almighty God. From the rising of the sun till its setting, let God's name be praised. On the lips of children, let God's name be praised. In the visions of the old and the dreaming of the young, let God's name be praised. In the banquet hall of heaven, in our ordinary spaces, made holy by God's presence, in the quiet corners of our hearts, let God's name be praised forever. Come, let us worship God.
Let us prepare our hearts and our minds to receive God's word with a prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that our hearts would be open to you, that we may release in this moment every defense against your spirit's guidance, that we would receive the wisdom you intend for us and be formed as you desire in order to amplify your kingdom here on earth. Lord, in this pandemic time and in this hour of worship, As poet Amanda Gorman writes, let it be said that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried. We are here for you, Lord. Speak, your servants are listening. May this all be so. May it all be so. Amen. Our reading for today comes to us from the Gospel of Mark. Prior to this passage, Jesus has fed the 4,000. He's been curing the sick, dealing with his at times dubious disciples, and in the breath preceding our passage, spoken to the crowds, telling them that any who would be his followers must deny themselves and take up their cross, losing their lives for the sake of the gospel in order to gain the kingdom, as it were. Listen now to God's word. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such that no one on earth could bleach them. And there he appeared to them, Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Here ends our reading. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One morning, when Gregor Samsa awoke from troubled dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a horrible vermin. This is one of the great first lines in literature. It is the opening sentence of Franz Kafka's book, Metamorphosis, about a a salesman who suddenly turns into a giant cockroach. The book is absolutely as troubling as it sounds. The opening sentence is what is called a paraprosdokion, paraprosdokion a figure of speech in which the latter part of the sentence, phrase, or larger discourse is surprising or unexpected in a way that causes the reader or the listener to reframe or reinterpret the first part. Comedian Groucho Marx turned this into an art form with such lines as, I've had a perfectly wonderful evening, but this wasn't it. Other examples include the quote by Bertrand Russell, war does not determine who is right, only who is left. Or Will Rogers, I don't belong to an organized political party. I'm a Democrat. And Henry Youngman's famous, take my wife, please. Para pros dokian. When the last part of a sentence is so surprising that it reframes or reinterprets 
the first part, what has gone before. If I'd heard the word metamorphosis prior to being assigned Kafka's good book in AP English in high school, I sure don't recall it. At least not in a way that was anywhere near as memorable as Kafka's use. The first words of the opening sentence lull you a bit with an image of a man waking up from sleep. Then we catch on that something was amiss, troubled dreams. We've all had those troubled dreams. We then read that Samsa found himself transformed in his bed into, how interesting could the next words be? A horrible vermin, what? The opening sentences of the ninth chapter in Mark are a paraprostokian. A few days have passed since our last event, okay. Jesus leads them up a high mountain, okay, a little strange. Mark makes note that they are apart by themselves, so we're teed up for the fact that something in the narrative is readying to launch. How surprising could the next words be? And he was transfigured before them. What? The word translated transfigured is metamorphosis. Metamorphos in the Greek. Jesus one moment looks like an ordinary guy and suddenly in the next, he is bright shining as the sun. The latter part of the sentence reframes our perception of the first part of the sentence. And seeing Jesus like this now, so spectacularly changed in such dazzling clothes, surrounded by such ancient, famous friends with the voice of God speaking, well, this causes the disciples to have a little metamorphosis of their own, a transfiguration of their understanding. Up until this point in the narrative, they oscillate between being amazed at Jesus's deeds and kind of struggling to get it. They didn't understand his parables. They witnessed the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000 and yet panic in the next verses over not having packed a snack for a trip. Now they see Jesus for who he truly is. Witness the blinding holiness of his divinity beam through his humanity. And for them and for us, not only does Jesus look different, but suddenly their surroundings look different too. Not because the mountain had undergone any sort of metamorphosis, but because once a place is a staging area for the holy, it is never perceived the same again. Like the markers around Durham acknowledging the spots where certain things happened in its history with civil rights or in the development of its industries, when you encounter God's presence and power and love in a special way, that place is marked. The place where it happens becomes sacred ground, as it were. Each time you pass it, you perceive it just a, a little differently because of what happened there. Some of you shared images of places that are sacred ground for you for our service today. Thank you. Others may see a forest or a sunset, but you saw God. That word, metamorphos, translated transfigured here, is used one other time in the Bible when it is translated transformed in Romans 12.2. When Paul writes, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Woodenly translated, that sentence reads, resist likening yourself to the age or the era that you are in and be changed completely by engaging in a repetitive process that makes you chronologically new. Think new creation. Don't you find it rather shocking that detailing a time decades after the moment we read about in our passage today, all the way in the story of the early church, the word metamorphos used to describe Jesus's transfiguration is applied in a charge to you? Could it be 
that Paul's use of the word in Romans was a paraprosdokian of its own, challenging its readers, challenging you, challenging us and those to come to reimagine our understanding of what is happening in this first use of the word here. Could it be that the story about ourselves and the capacity for our holiness to shine through as disciples in the ordinary landscape of our daily lives is being reframed in light of what we see happening to Jesus here on the mountaintop because Paul wants us to see ourselves in Jesus in this moment? It could be. Except Paul wrote his letter to the Romans first. Most estimate that he penned his words about 20 years before the Gospel of Mark was written. So could it be then that Mark's account was actually the paraprosdokian? Could it be that the story about ourselves and the capacity for our holiness to shine through as disciples in the ordinary landscape of our daily lives is being reframed in light of what we see happening to Jesus here on the mountaintop because Mark wants us to know that Jesus sees himself in us. Jesus came as one of us, Humanity as it has always been, humanity for as long as it will ever be. And we share with Jesus in his capacity to be changed, to have holiness shine through, to experience a metamorphosis of substance that reframes what we've known about our past in light of what God is doing now, which is shocking. And that is to have the very same Jesus who was transfigured on the mountaintop find a home in us. To have Jesus' own story in his life, death, and resurrection take shape because of us, for us. What is happening right now in the world, in the church, in you as Christ's own Holy Spirit takes up residence in your soft tissues, challenges us to reimagine our past as the launching point for God's activity today, no matter what it held. And it invites us to perceive our ordinary, everyday surroundings as sacred ground as they serve as the staging area for the holy. So let us never perceive them the same way again. This Wednesday, as I said earlier, is Ash Wednesday, when we will recall the time when dust was transfigured into the human flesh of our lives and will be transfigured into dust again. It christens the season of Lent that seeks to aid us through the repetition of spiritual practices and disciplines in removing every obstacle in our hearts and habits that would stand in the way of us being and perceiving ourselves and every other person as we truly are, bright, shining as the sun. I wonder how you and God will use this Lenten season to remove some of those obstacles to being and perceiving yourself and every other as you and as they truly are, bright shining as the sun. I wonder in what ways God will call you to resist conformity to the age that we are in and embark on a process of formation such that you are changed as the holiness of Jesus shines more and more through. I wonder where you will meet God in the course of your ordinary days such that you come to see the entirety of your landscape as holy ground. I wonder what the paraprosdokian will be that will cause everything about your life today to be reframed in light 
of you waking up one morning seven weeks from now on Easter Sunday to find that you had been transformed into what? I can't wait to see. I can't wait to see. Amen. The whole of the Christian life is a response to God's word in the many ways that it comes to us. Responding to the word proclaimed, let us affirm what we believe using words from the Confession of 1967, where the church asserted that the civil rights movement was, in fact, a kingdom movement. Please join me now in speaking aloud from your home what we believe. God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of the human mind. Human thought ascribes to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness. But God reveals divine love in Jesus Christ by showing power in the form of a servant, wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinful men and women. The power of God's love in Christ to transform the world discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and Creator who made all things to serve the purpose of God's love. With an urgency born of this hope, the church applies itself to present tasks and strives for a better world. It does not identify limited progress with the kingdom of God on earth, nor does it despair in the face of disappointment and defeat. In steadfast hope, the church looks beyond all partial achievement to the final triumph of God. Hello, friends of Trinity Avenue. What a privilege and honor it is to be sharing with you today my faith testimony. To talk about my faith in God cannot be discussed without talking about you, my faith community. Because when I officially became a member of Trinity about three years ago, I was entering a stage of my life when I was rebuilding my faith in God and the church. And this was not my intention when I first visited Trinity in 2017. But this community that we have here galvanized a renewed love of God and the church for me. 
And it was through friendships and mentorships where I finally heard God calling me to something I'd never expected God to call me to. For God was calling me to ordained ministry in order to bring hope, comfort, and support to survivors of sexual violence. And after years of being away from the church, I had completely forgotten about what it meant to be Presbyterian or a Christian. All I knew was I was inspired by what was happening here and that I wanted to be a part of it. I've been rebuilding my faith since my return to the church in 2018, so I feel like my testimony is constantly ebbing and flowing as I go through periods of growth. But it has been this past year, albeit awful and terrible in so many ways, <laughs> that, I have been that I have experienced immense transformation and growth by the grace of God through my involvement with Trinity, my studies at Duke, and my internship with First Presbyterian of Henderson. This past year, I've been introduced to the sacred, beautiful task of preaching the word of God to all. I have been introduced to the challenging venture of studying the scriptures and biblical languages, but most importantly of all, learning how to be a better faith leader and friend to all of God's people. At my internship with FPC, I have had the pleasure again and again of serving this wonderful congregation of Presbyterians. Presbyterians, which remind me a lot of you. But there was a moment this summer when I was feeling really disheartened about my participation in my internship and in the church as a whole. I felt like I wasn't contributing anything valuable to the life of the church. That feeling continued throughout the summer, as I'm sure many other people fell as we go went through more months of isolation and quarantine. But in August, when my placement with FPC was renewed for the academic year, I got an email from a congregant. The congregant expressed how thankful they were for my offerings of the prayers of the people over the summer. And this congregant quoted a line to me that had stood out to her, something I had spoken two and a half months before and not thought about since. And she said to me, I want to know the God that you love. And in that moment, I felt like a jolt of energy renewed my faith in my ministry in God. That simple email showed me the power and difference that happens when we as Christians attempt to emulate the grace and love of our trying God. I realized that there is still so much I can do for God's people, regardless of the situations of the world, because simple things matter in my ministry. Simple things like inspiring a person and helping them see the love of God. And this is where you come in again. I learned to be this kind of Christian and friend under the guidance, nurturing, and love of my family at Trinity. This community, through the power and sovereignty of our God, has made me a better person, a better classmate, a better candidate for ordination, and most importantly, a more faithful, loving member of this earthly kingdom. I'm still growing. And in the next year, I know there will be new parts to this testimony of this young faith. But what's important is that you will always be part of the story. And I am so grateful for that. To God be the glory for this testimony. Peace to you, my friends. Our prayers of the people this day come with a few minor edits from Cole Arthur Riley, who composes prayers and shares them at blackliturgist.com. Riley has a prophetic spirit and is an incisive crafter of words. So I hope you'll enjoy hearing her voice this day. If you'd like to, I'd encourage you to follow her on social media. Her handles will be made available to you on a slide at the end of this service. Let us pray. Sheltering God, you reveal yourself to us that we might live in the hope of your glory. Help us to trust this promise, for there are times it feels like our present reality will always be, like transfiguration is a trick of the eye under the desert sun. 
and it can become difficult to dream. Our imaginations for healing and health can become far too small. Expand them, God, that we might grow the branches of hope into something we can cling on to without them buckling under the weight of our next tragedy. Let our dreaming be our rest, a shade from the heat of evils of this world, that our alienation and oppression would not resign us to the wilderness. Be who you say you are. If you are a stronghold, Lord, then keep the marginalized within the walls of your chest. If you are a destroyer of the veil, come and let it fall from the eyes of those who do injustice and make death. Allow us to see Christ the Beloved One in every face and footprint, in our solitude and sorrow, and protect our dreaming, Lord, that as we wait for you, our hope would not be tarnished by our tears, but renewed, made sacred glints of light in the darkness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, who chooses sides, you know how we are prone to set up shop in the status quo, how we can be unsure of what to say, terrified to offend or get it wrong. Forgive us for idolizing the lukewarmth of the middle. We can wear it as its own brand of superiority, believing it makes us virtuous and rational and above the fray. But Lord, help us to remember there are those things worth fighting for, that you are a God who does not only hold peace, but division, that you entered the world and showed us what just and loving choice and protest looks like. Grant us that wisdom which allows us to perceive when our desire to not choose sides is rooted more in fear than it is in justice and righteousness. In our training to think the middle is holy ground, let us listen to the beloved Son and to come down with him from the Mount of Comfort to the streets of conflict and opposition. And as we do so, help us to not become enslaved to any new position or stance, that our lives, our bodies, and our choices would ever align with what we believe to be true and good and beautiful. Move our souls into that holy integrity that is you yourself. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Care for us, transfiguring God. Care for your church and care for your world. Make us new, for we ask this in the name of Christ, remembering the prayer he taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. People of God, go forth this day in hope and in joy to love and serve the Lord in all that you do and abide always in God's peace. Remember, we did not leave the church. We went forth to be the church. So as you do so, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Let all God's people say, Amen.